Welcome to our introduction to Earth Observation uh, webinar brought to you by the Copernicus User Uptake Project, funded by the EU and coordinated by DLR German Aerospace. My name is uh, Lynn Healy. I'm a technical project manager in the digital and data team at the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, and I'll be your chair for today's webinar. The Joint Nature Conservation Committee, JNCC, is the public body that advises the UK government and devolved administrations on UK-wide and international nature conservation. We are in an impartial scientific authority and we provide advice on practical, policy-relevant, evidence-based solutions to support decision-making. Let's move my slides on. If it works, there we go. Uh, the aim of today's webinar is to introduce you to the potential, of role, the potential role of Earth observation data, products and services for operational use across a range of policy areas. Before we go any further, I'll need to go over some housekeeping rules. And you've probably already heard that we're recording today's session and we'll be making it publi publicly available on the JNCC YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be hiding delicate names and images. So please remain on mute uh, throughout and keep your cam webcams off uh, unless you're presenting and want to put them on. Uh, we'll also be sharing a uh, selection of the, the PDFs. Um, we'll be sharing the slides via PDF, apologies, um, and we'll email these directly to you and let them let you know when they're available through Twitter. If you wish to ask the question, speakers questions, please type these into your questions tab. Uh, and if I ask your question to the speaker and you wish to add a follow-up or a clarifying question, please uh, use the raise your hand function and I will do my best to unmute you and uh, bring you in uh, verbally for the follow-on question. So obviously, please note that you should be happy to be uh, introduced by your name if you want to do so because it's been recorded. Please feel free to uh, tweet about the webinar uh, throughout or afterwards. And if you do so, please use our uh, GenCC hashtag so that we can pick it up and retweet, etc. At the end of today's session, we'll be sharing a link to a short feedback survey. Uh, please do fill this in as it really does help us to improve these sorts of sessions in future. And, uh, and all the feedback is anonymous. So today's agenda looks like this, and the focus will be on introducing Earth observation data and technologies with lots of case studies and practical examples. Our speakers are Guao Jones and Paula Lightfoot from JNCC, Helena Sykes from Natural Resources Wales, and Mark Richardson from Planet. To kick, to kick off the webinar, I'll just first explain a little bit about the Copernicus program, the funding source, and the JNCC's uh, Copernicus User Uptake Project. The Copernicus program is the most ambitious Earth observation program to date. Copernicus delivers operational data by observing our environment, primarily using a suite of satellites called the Sentinels. It collects, stores and analyzes data and provides products and services openly and freely in a wide range of applications, as you can see here. The funding for today's session is the uh, Caroline Herschel Framework Partnership Agreement. It's a consortium of organisations of which JNCC are one, and it aims to increase the uptake of use of Copernicus data, products and services. It does this by implementing a series of actions. JNCC's statutory UK and international remit and strong culture of partnership, working and innovation means we're uniquely placed to develop shared cost-effective solutions for our partners and stakeholders. So our action has a series of components designed to enable long-term uptake of Copernicus data across UK public environmental functions. Today's webinar introducing Earth Observation is part of two of our projects, one working with the Animal and Plant Health Agency and the other with Welsh Government and Forestry and Land Scotland. So now to start the session, um, I'm now pleased to introduce Gua Jones with a couple of slides from Paula in amongst to explain what Earth Observation is and to give us a tour of the technology. So over to you, Gua. Can you see my slides and hear me? I can. Perfect. It's gone again. Yeah, can see them now. 
Okay. <clears throat> So thanks, Lynn, for the introduction. And uh, I am going to kick things off today by giving everyone uh, a basic introduction to Earth observation. So an Earth observation 101, if you will. So the purpose of this first session by me is to go through the basic science of Earth observation uh, and to give you a flavour of what the technology can do from the sensors perspective. Um, later on, you will hear what can be done from the perspectives of the application side and the integrating Earth observation into oper operational EOS side. So hopefully at the end of the afternoon, you will have a complete overview of what it takes to work with these data and what it can do for your respective work areas. Um, I will also be raising awareness of the advantages and limitations of the technology uh, and will hopefully give you the tools to be able to ask yourselves uh, the right sorts of questions when it comes to answering whether Earth observation data can help you with your work areas. So we start off with understanding the terms. Uh, now, if you've come across the technology before, you will have heard the term remote sensing and earth observation used. So what's the difference? Um, in truth, both terms are used interchangeably within the, the community. Uh, and the term you will hear is largely dependent on geography. Uh, so for example, our colleagues in America have always preferred to use the term remote sensing, while over here in Europe, we tend to use Earth observation more. Um, this is starting to change and Earth observation is becoming the more standard term um, and hopefully these definitions will give you a clue as to why that is. Um, so remote sensing is the term we use when gathering information about an object or phenomenon without making physical contact, um, while Earth observation is gathering information specifically about the Earth systems using remote sensing technologies. So all Earth observation is remote sensing, but not all remote sensing is Earth observation. Uh, the example I like to use here is the remote sensing technologies they use in medicine, such as x-rays, which is clearly not Earth observation. Um, so all the technologies we use uh, is based on the science of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I found this fun little diagram from xkcd.com to help you remember those lessons in high school physics classes about the spectrum. Um, now, we only use a tiny proportion of the spectrum with our own eyes, um, the visible light part, um, and you can see how narrow that part of the spectrum is. Uh, now, the sensors we use uh, for Earth observation uses this whole part of the spectrum. So when you hear me talk about sensors seeing beyond the visible, uh, this is what I mean. So many sensors out there collect data in the infrared part of the spectrum, which we cannot see with our eyes, moving through to thermal and then onto microwaves and radio waves. Um, so the sensors uh, we work with generally have uh, work in two different ways, uh, which are called passive and active sensing. Um, most Earth observation sensors are passive, um, only receiving data from reflected sunlight, um, but a few sensors utilize active sensing by capturing the return of their own transmitted signal. Um, passive sensors cannot see through cloud, but active sensors are generally not affected by cloud. Um, we don't really use the terms passive and active in everyday language in the field, so when referring to these sensors, we tend to use the term optical um, for passive um, and then the names of the technologies um, for active sensors, for example, radar and LIDAR. The key point here is that remote sensing technologies do not directly measure the Earth's surface, but uses light and waves to infer the Earth's surface. So we measure by proxy. Um, and this is why calibration of sensors, uh, which almost all satellites go through before missions become nominal, uh, and validation of outputs are always a necessity. Now, when we think about Earth observation, uh, we automatically think of space, um, but remote sensing technologies that observe the Earth's surface can be utilized on a variety of platforms. Um, in fact, the earliest form of Earth observation is aerial photography uh, captured from planes. 
or aerial platforms. Um, so sensors can also be put on drones to collect imagery uh, and these technologies are rapidly evolving. Uh, so when making decisions about whether to use a satellite or a drone, um, the most important thing to remember is that satellites can cover a lot more ground, um, albeit at coarser detail, while drones can capture high levels of detail, but it would take you a very long time to cover the same area that satellites can. Um, so there are also other regulations with uh, aerial and drone flights to, um, which don't really impact satellites. So those platforms could be more expensive in the long run, depending on what you're measuring. Um, for example, if you wanted to count birds, then satellites probably won't really help you that much. Um, so it does depend on circumstance and context. Um, but more about that from Paula later. So if we just take a, a closer look at satellites, um, there are currently thousands of them out there, but only about 800 uh, satellites are dedicated to Earth observation. Um, this number is rapidly changing and I have to update it every now and again. Um, so these cover also cover meteorology, uh, which tend to operate in the geostationary orbit. Uh, so following the rotation of the Earth, keeping a fixed eye on the same area, while most of the other satellites that uh, we're familiar with operate in low Earth orbit. Um, so similar to the simulation on the slide. So it takes a while to get full coverage of the Earth. <clears throat> Um, so moving on to the, the considerations that um, would be important to be aware of and to know um, when it comes to uh, understanding the data, there are four resolutions that we should bear in mind um, and, and that um, hopefully understanding these will, will uh, make you move forward leaps and bounds to understand the data. Um, from now on, I'm mostly talking about optical or passive sensors, but I will let you know um, uh, when these refer to passive sensors as well. Um, so the first resolution is spatial, uh, and this refers to a sensor's ability to identify the smallest size detail of a pattern in an image. Um, so what we really mean when we mean spatial, when we talk about spatial resolution, is pixel size. Um, now both Passive and active sensors have pixels, um, but I'll explain in a second what we mean by pixels. Um, the second resolution is uh, spectral, uh, and this refers to the sensitivity of a sensor to respond within a part of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. Um, and this is only relevant to optical sensors. Um, the third re uh, is radiometric. Um, so this is probably the, the resolution that you need to worry about the least, um, but it does refer to uh, the ability to measure signal strength or brightness of objects. And again, this is relevant to all types of sensing. And last but definitely not least um, is temporal resolution, uh, and this refers to the frequency at which a sensor revisits an area. Um, and again, this is relevant to all types of sensing. Uh, so the reason why these resolutions are important for you to know is that there's usually a trade-off between one uh, or sometimes all of these. For example, traditionally, if you wanted a sensor from space that covers all of the surface of the Earth every day, then you would have to accept a much lower spatial resolution of about one kilometer squared or lower. Um, the technology is, however, improving at rapid speeds, uh, and you will hear about a constellation that offers high temporal and spatial resolution from Mark Richardson at Planet later. So what is a pixel? Um, the, the simplest way to explain is that it's the smallest element of an image and they are usually square in shape. Um, they record a mean value of the measurement per pixel. So if your pixel size is 10 meters squared, then you will get one value for that whole area in your image. Pixels are not linked to any real world objects on the ground, so they have no relationship with anything that we see uh, in an image. Um, for optical data, the pixel size is determined by the field of view, which is the diagram you can see here, uh, which means the angle at which the imaging optics is looking down at the Earth's surface. So if you have optics with a low angle looking straight down, then your pixel size is going to be small, but if your optics has a, has, a, has a much wider angle, then your pixel sizes are going to be bigger. 
Uh, you will notice that I've labelled optical only in a couple of these factors. Um, now, radar data, like I mentioned, does have pixels, but they're not determined by field of view. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a slightly different way to get to pixels. Um, and this means that they're also not always square in shape and tend to be more um, rectangles or oblique in shape. Um, so now we're going to take a quick look at the, uh, what it means, what the different spatial re resolution means and what they look like. Um, first of all, I'll explain the scale we use when referring to spatial resolution. So the scale is low, medium, high, very high, uh, and this refers to the number of pixels it takes to generate an image. So an image with one kilometre squared pixels has a much lower number of pixels than an image with 10 metre squared pixels. Um, the numbers you're seeing here are common pixel sizes uh, in sensors that currently exist, um, but the images you're seeing refer to a small island in the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean, which uh, is only about 100 meters wide. Um, so I'm showing you a Landsat 8 image, a Sentinel 2 image and a Pleiades image. Um, and how they've captured this island in their own respective spatial resolutions. Um, for Landsat, you can only just make out that it's an island uh, and you would be able to guess that there was some vegetation in it and some sand. Um, it's a bit better for Sentinel-2 and you would probably be able to track uh, any changes to the coastline um, or if the extent of the sand or vegetation areas have changed. While the Pleiades image, um, you can pick out all of the individual scrub bushes um, in the sand area. Now, understanding your application is pretty important when accepting that a particular resolution is good enough to do the job because there are data access costs involved. Um, so uh, if you're happy with Landsat or Sentinel imagery, um, both of these uh, sensors provide data open and free at the point of use, uh, as do many of the other lower resolution satellites. They tend to have no um, data access costs, um, whereas the, the player these image is pretty expensive in comparison. Um, you're always going to have to pay to access this level of spatial resolution from space, so consider carefully whether Sentinel or Landsat or any of the other lower spatial resolution satellites could do the job first. So moving on to spectral resolution. Um, this section only refers to optical data sets. Um, so images are made out of a series of what we call bands. Um, the next slide will give you a visualization of what I mean by bands. Um, but a single band when displayed uh, is always black and white in a GIS, for example, if you only display one band. But when you combine more of these bands, then you can generate images that represent what we might, um, how we, we might see the, uh, the world with our own eyes. Um, so we call this red, green, blue image or a true color image. Um, so these bands uh, represent uh, one part of the blue, one part of the green, and one part of the red parts of the visible part of the spectrum respectively. And only when you combine them do we visualize images in true color. Um, thankfully, our own eyes do this for us, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so the spectral resolution refers to how many of these bands are present in one image. Um, and it also refers to how narrow they are. So by narrow, I mean what is the uh, breadth of the electromagnetic spectrum that they cover in, in one band. Uh, so most optical images are multispectral uh, and will include a small number of bands at a relatively broad frequency. Um, and hyperspectral imagery is what we would call images that have a, a very large number of bands at a very, very small frequency. Um, these hyperspectral sensors are less common, um, with only one true hyperspectral satellite currently still in operation in space, um, but unfortunately Hyperion is nearing the end of its mission life and is not operating uh, at nominal. Um, but uh, the future technologies means that more hyperspectral sensors will become available um, in, in the very, very near future. Um, so to help with the visualization of bands, I've got the spectrum up again, um, and this is what I mean, hopefully, uh, what I mean by hyperspectral versus multispectral. Um, so 
each of the bands are represented by a box here and um, most of the multispectral images which is Aster, Landsat, 7 and 8 and Sentinel 2 uh, have one box each for red, green and blue um, and the wider the box the, the broader the frequency um, um, so the bottom line represents modus um, while MODIS isn't truly hyperspectral, hopefully it demonstrates that, you know, because it has three, three bands in the red part of the spectrum as opposed to one, that it has a higher spectral resolution than all the other sensors that you can see here. Um, you will also notice that bands coincide with peaks in the atmospheric transmission, uh, and that is not by mistake. Um, so uh, um, these parts of the spectrum are where electromagnetic energy is uh, transmitted. Without it, we wouldn't get a reflectance measurement at all. Um, so those of you who are BDI'd will notice that there are some bands um, in those areas where there, there are zero atmospheric transmission. Um, and these are mostly put on sensors to capture uh, what is going on in the atmosphere uh, at, at a time an image is captured. Uh, and this helps us with um, understanding the atmospheric conditions so that we can uh, process the data to surface reflectance later on. Um, I will talk a little bit about pre-processing later. The other thing you might have noticed is that the atmospheric transmission percentage is pretty low in the visible um, and that limits and that basically limits the amount of information that we can capture in, in that part. We can still get some data but it's, it's not at its maximum capacity. So one of the easiest ways for me to demonstrate why we capture images in these bands is the example of remote sensing of vegetation. Um, now we know how light interacts with leaves, which is what, what I'm showing you here, um, and we know that a large part of the terrestrial environment is covered by vegetation, and we also know that it's one of our critical life support systems on the planet. So it makes sense for us to make sensors that are able to monitor vegetation. So the visible part of red and blue are mostly absorbed by chloroplasts close to the leaf surface, while the green part is, is of the visible is reflected and this is why you know we see plants as green so this is probably quite common knowledge to uh, all of you um, you will notice that the reflectance is still relatively low compared to the energy that hits the leaf surface uh, and this is related to the atmospheric transmission that i mentioned on the last slide uh, now the near infrared part of the spectrum is completely ignored by the chloroplasts and interacts with the middle part of the leaf or spongy mesophyll uh, which means we can understand a little more about cell structure uh, with data collected in the near infrared. You will also notice that a lot of the energy is reflected back um, and that means we get a lot more information in the near infrared and beyond. Um, so this is why Earth observation and seeing beyond the visible is powerful as it allows us to see things um, and measure things that we wouldn't be able to with our own eyes. Um, so to allow us to differentiate between different types of vegetation and indeed land covers uh, within the images, uh, we use what we know about reflectance characteristics of those land covers um, and uh, create curves like this, um, which are called spectral signatures. Um, so these are the different land cover, the most basic of, of the land cover types. Um, for vegetation, you will see the curve. Um, now the shape uh, for all types of vegetation are, is likely to be the same. Um, there'll be probably slight difference in value uh, depending on the type of vegetation uh, for example conifer trees will have much lower um, near infrared than broadleaf trees um, but there'll only be slight differences the shape of the curve for vegetation is, is always going to be the same or for healthy vegetation at least um, so this allows us to explore vegetation health so any deviations from this expected curve would indicate a change and that something is going on with the vegetation in that area. Um, so similarly, you will notice that water does have a spectral signature uh, and that beyond near infrared, um, all light is attenuated or, uh, or absorbed. So we, get, we should expect nothing in reflectance. Um, but so this massively decreases the chances of what we could do on the water surface and below. And a quick mention on how imagery does walk, work underwater. Um, so light is attenuated by water and the intensity of light decreases exponentially with water depth. 
Um, now, you will have just seen from the spectral signatures that water does absorb everything beyond the visible, so you should expect no reflectance in the near infrared and beyond. Um, but you will get some reflectance with shorter wavelengths, so in the blue part or the green part of the visible, so those are the two bands from multispectral imagery that you're, you have the best chance of working with in these environments. Um, you will see that the blue bar does extend beyond 20 metres depth, but this is the best case scenario. Um, and there are other things that impact what we can sense. Um, so in reality, uh, we probably uh, have, uh, could confidently say that we could use um, this sort of remote sensing up to 10 meters, 15 meters at best, but the accuracy significantly decreases after that. Um, so one of these causes is water turbidity, uh, which causes light to scatter, uh, and that unfortunately increases the chance of light absorption. So very turbid water would significantly decrease the depths that we can sense. Um, but conditions at the surface play a massive role as well. So sun glint um, happens when sunlight is reflected off the surface of the water at the same angle as the satellite sensor views it. So it results in a, in a mirror-like specular reflection uh, and that decreases the depths that we can sense underwater. Um, and waves, um, if, there, if, there's a, if there's a lot of them, that creates a rough surface and that increases scattering of light. And that also decreases the depths that we can sense. So opportunities for underwater Earth observation observation are highly dependent on water conditions as well as wavelengths. Um, so you would need a bit of luck and uh, probably a high temporal resolution to increase your chances of getting useful data to work in, the, in this environment. And again, this refers to uh, optical data only. Uh, a quick slide on radiometric resolution, uh, but I would assume that this is the resolution you need to worry least about with your questions, like I mentioned earlier. But it is good to be aware of what values you're expecting when opening an image for the first time. So when referring to radiometric resolution, what I really mean is bit depth. So a two-bit image will only give you four values, one, two, three, and four, while um, an 8-bit image will give you values between 0 and 256. So older sensors, such as the Landsat um, earlier missions, uses 8-bit data, as does uh, aerial photography. Aerial photography tends to be 8-bit data uh, and a lot of um, sensors that we put on drones as well. Um, but the largest bit depth that you'll come across today is from Sentinel-2. Um, and that gives you values from 0 to 65,535. Um, so if you're trying to distinguish between two pixels that look very, very similar in colour, but may have a different condition, for example, a semi-improved grassland uh, to a species-rich meadow, they'll probably look the same from above, but they're completely different habitats on the ground, um, then you have a better chance of separating them with the imagery with a, a, big, a large bit depth. Um, because it gives you a bigger range to choose from. Unfortunately, there is a small limitation uh, with larger bit depths, uh, and that is that it's twice the volume of data. So you have to consider storage volumes and costs. Um, just to give you a feel of the bit depths of the most popular optical sensors out there at the moment, um, so Sentinel-2 is the largest, of course, but a lot of them uh, operate on the 11 to 12 bit ratio. Um, so moving on to the fourth temp uh, resolution, which is temporal. Um, so why is temporal resolution really important to consider? There's lots of reasons, but for optical data, the issue here is cloud, because these sensors can't see through them. So while a mission may have frequent revisits over a certain area of the world, um, it may take make little difference to those parts of the world that, that are perpetually covered in cloud. Um, so there is, this is where the missions that acquire daily data have a significant advantage because it massively increases the chances of getting data at the surface. Um, the example you're seeing here is from the MODIS sensor on the Aqua satellite, so uh, one kilometre square pixels. Uh, and it captures data over the globe every day. Uh, you can see that the daily data is covered in gaps because of cloud, but if you merge more days together, then eventually you will get a complete picture without any gaps. 
Unfortunately, temporal merging means that you do lo lose the most accurate information. Um, so that, again, there's a trade-off for doing this. Um, but generally, the trade-off is always with temporal resolution. So high temporal resolution is uh, something that doesn't traditionally go with high spatial resolution. Um, the Landsat missions, you know, 30 meter pixels cover the globe every 16 days at the equator. Um, well, Sentinel-2 is probably the, the best you're going to get out there at, uh, um, at 10 meter spectral resolution, uh, spatial resolution because it covers the globe every five days at the equator. Now, I say the equator, but um, as I mentioned earlier, they, these satellites operate in, in lower orbit, so it takes a while to cover all the globe, but the frequency is much higher on, on the poles. Um, so five days at the equator probably equals two to three days, every two to three days um, in the higher latitudes or the latitudes that we currently are in the UK. Um, when it comes to temporal frequency, the commercial sector, so the very high spatial resolution, tends to work slightly differently, um, and um, they like to, or they prefer to task the satellites, uh, so point it at different parts of the Earth at different times. So the, their temporal resolution or uh, availability is dependent on their availability and task list. Um, the exception, once again, here is Planet, which you will hear about later. Um, so radar data, um, this does apply to radar data. Uh, clouds are less of an issue for radar, obviously, but you still have to consider the frequency. So, for example, uh, the temporal resolution for Sentinel-1 is global coverage every six days at the equator. Now, I've not really talked much about active sensors, um, but I've got a couple of slides to give you a flavor of what is possible um, without going into too much detail on how they work, uh, as uh, we don't have enough time to cover that. Um, we do have other training sessions on radar that are happening later on in the year. So if you are interested in learning more, then uh, please um, uh, register for those. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, the active sensors are always more complex, uh, produce data that can be morphed into several different types of data, data types, so um, not as straightforward as optical data sets. So I would always recommend you get an expert on board to help deal, deal with these data types regardless. Um, so here I'm just showing you the different frequencies that radar data, um, or to be more precise, synthetic aperture radar operates, uh, and the sort of things that these frequencies interact with on the ground. Um, as you will remember from my slide on the spectrum, uh, these sensors operate in the microwave and radio wave section. Um, we've got missions that operate in the X, C, S, L and P bands. So these bands are very, very similar to the bands I showed you earlier um, under the spectral resolution for optical. Now the wavelength is the critical factor here and it determines what the radar signal interacts with on the ground. So X-band radar has very little capacity to penetrate into uh, broadleaf forest uh, as it operates at a wavelength of about three centimeters. So the data from these sensors will give you information on structure of the leaves, on the top of ca tree canopies, for example, but nothing beyond that. Um, C-band can penetrate a little bit further and will interact with the branches of the trees, while L-band um, interacts with the trunks of the trees. Uh, the most common form of radar data output is what we call a backscatter product, uh, and this is the image that's in the background. Um, um, so the image in the background is actually from Sentinel-1, which is C-band radar, um, and C-band radar tends to be most commonly known as the workhorse of the radar sensors. Um, now, backscatter refers to surface roughness. Um, so, a high value in backscatter is related to a rough surface, so trees, mature crop, and will give you um, a, a high value, which in, in a black and white image come out as really, really bright. Whereas a low backscatter value um, refers to uh, smooth surfaces, so water bodies tend to have smooth surfaces, uh, and these will come out uh, as black in images. Um, Paula will show you more of these images later and talk you through how to interpret what you're seeing, as it's not quite as straightforward as interpreting optical data because optical data is more like looking at a photograph. 
Um, it is also worth men mentioning at this point that Sentinel-1 is currently the only radar satellite mission out there with open data. So other missions such as Tandem-X, which is X-band radar, or ALOS Pulsar, which is L-band radar, are not free at the point of use. So data access costs uh, apply. Um, the other most common type of active sensing is LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. Um, these sensors work by sending out millions of light pulses or lasers uh, and then record what comes back. Um, you do get uh, what we call a point cloud as a first output with LiDAR data, uh, and it can give you information about the landscape in three dimensions. Um, but the most common outputs or, or um, application from, from these data uh, are mostly to generate digital elevation or terrain models or bathymetry. So these sensors are mostly operated from a plane. You can also put them on tripods, uh, terrestrial laser scanning is what we call that, or you can put them on the bottoms of boats. Um, the LiDAR missions haven't fared well in space, but there are a couple operating. Um, and the reason for this is that the power required to send the lasers out at the distance from low orbit is is too much for the for the for the satellites so um that's why we don't really have many active lidar uh, sensors in space um, but isat is a lidar mission that's still operating although it isn't nominal and um jedi is the other one which uh, the jedi sensor is currently on the international space station and it's it's a purely research mission uh, and because it's on the international space station it only covers um up to cardiff um of the uk unfortunately so uh, it does not give us complete coverage of the uk now the the one other major thing that i need to tell you before i finish uh, and that is the fact that not a lot of sensor data arrives onto your computer without some pre-processing required first there are exceptions, of course, uh, so some of the marine missions um, and lower spatial resolution satellite data do tend to produce analysis ready data sets. Um, but the higher spatial resolution sensors tend to not do this, uh, basically because it's difficult. Um, but saying that methods are now well established, um, you would need to be an expert to carry out the pre-processing, processing, unfortunately. So this was seen as a big barrier for picking up Earth observation data uh, in all sectors. Um, but in the UK, we do have a long history of producing analysis-ready data sets, starting with the Landsat archive for Wales. Um, and Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 analysis-ready data is now routinely produced for all of the UK and being made available to all users free of charge. Um, so for Sentinel-1, we produced the Backscatter product, like I mentioned earlier. But just to make you aware that other products are available, such as interferometry, um, so just to give you a quick um, introduction on how to access the Sentinel-1 and 2 data sets that we produce, um, I'm going to hand over to Paula for the next couple of slides. Yes, hello everyone. Um, thank you. Um, I'm just going to talk through um, a couple of new services that have been launched this year um, to give us access to analysis ready data. As Gwawa said, it's very convenient, saves a lot of time and money just putting the data ready to use on our desktops into our GIS systems. Um, so the first of those is the DEFRA Earth Observation Data Service, which some of you might have heard about already, because um, this provides analysis-ready Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data um, for England, although it does cover, because the tiles are so large, it does cover a fair bit of Wales and Scotland as well at the borders. Um, and it provides access to staff at DEFRA and the agencies and the arm's length bodies. So you can log in using your Active Directory login. You don't need to remember another set of passwords. Um, this was launched um, with a beta release in February 2020 and then um, a live launch in July. Um, I just want to add that there is still some development going on with feedback from users. So it is getting even better. Um, the data available through it, um, there's an archive um, going back from October 2018 to the present. It's, um, there's only 18 months of data kept at any one time, but data older than that is available through CEDAR, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, and one of the most impressive things about this is the data is processed in near real time. So basically I can log into this in the morning and see data from Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2 that was captured yesterday, and then I can download it or stream it into GIS, which is just amazing. It's really fast. Um, 
the you can access data via downloading it um, but as Gwawa said the files are quite large um, so another good thing that the EO data service does is lets you draw a polygon um, and, and clip out your area of interest so you just download what you need. You can also use web services as they say so you don't download it you just stream it into GIS and you can use an API which is an application programming interface to access the data programmatically so you can bring it into say a Python script or an R code. Um, and the URL for the site, um, if you don't know it, is shown at the bottom of, um, of the slide, earthobs.defra.gov.uk. Oh, sorry, can just go back a second. Wrong way, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so you have to be on your organization's IT network to do this. I know a lot of us are working at home at the moment, so you do need to be on the network in order to access that URL. Um, but when, you, when you've done that and logged in, you can access the data. And also there's a lot of things like how-to guides um, and videos and slides from webinars and things that you can download as well to help you get started. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the second um, service is um, run by JNCC um, and it's um, developed with support from Scottish Government and Northern Ireland Environment Agency and we call this the Simple ARD service. Um, this provides um, data for analysis ready data for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, the reason it's simple is there's nothing simple about the data. It's processed to the exact same methods and the exact same standards as the data, def um, the DEFRA data for England. Um, but we don't provide um, this kind of website with web services and secure logins and all of that. We make the data publicly available through CEDA. So that's, that's where the simple part comes from. The data is exactly the same high quality. Um, so as I say, it's Sentinel-1 and 2 analysis ready data for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, there's an archive that's been processed from February 2019 to the present. Um, we are looking into making older data available as well because there is other data that we've been processing in an ad hoc way back to like 2015 when the 2014 2015 when the satellites were launched um, and the data processing here is still very fast it's not as fast as the EO data service because it's not fully automated there is a human element here so rather than getting new data overnight it's processed the week after capture so you get it within 7 to 14 days um, and this is very very new as well this was just launched in July this year um, so we'll just go on to the next slide to tell you how you can access the data and more information okay so um the data from both of those services is publicly accessible under an open government license through the CEDA archive and um, that stands for the Center for Environmental Data Analysis, um, which is provided on behalf of NERC through the National Center for Atmospheric Science and National Center for Earth Observation um, and CEDA is based at RAL um, STFC near Oxford. And there's um, some links on this slide that you might want to have a look at afterwards. Obviously, we're going to make the slides available after the webinar. Um, but it's got all the links so you can go straight to the data, straight to the analysis ready data for Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, there's also a satellite data finder interactive map so you can zoom into your area of interest and see what's available there. And if you want any help with any of this, then the link at the bottom is to a page on the JNCC website about the Simple ARD service. And on here, you can watch a video from a previous webinar and download presentation slides that's got um, kind of how-to information on accessing the ARD through CEDA. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Paula. Um, it is worth pointing out that um, you may have noticed that Wales isn't covered there, but Helena Sykes will talk about EO Data Down, which is the equivalent service for Wales uh, in her session later. Um, so fear not for all of those people from Welsh Government, but you do have your own system in Wales. Um, so to complete this first session, um, I'm just going to summarise what the limitations of using Earth observation are uh, and then following on a more positive note with a slide on the advantages. Um, so one of the biggest general limitations is that we can only sense what's on the surface uh, and for many multispectral sensors the surface is sometimes clouds. Um, so this also means we are limited to the tops of tree canopies, we can't really sense what's underneath without going out there or using an active sensor such as LiDAR which is particularly expensive. Um, we're also mostly seeing things from above which is a completely different perspective to what we're usually used to on the ground as humans uh, and that can often uh, sometimes lead to misinterpretations. Um, so the technology can only take us so far at this moment in time. 
So we were just talking about pre-processing, but atmospheric interference is another limitation. So we've, we have started to reduce the effects of this limitation as a barrier for access, um, but uh, we can definitely improve on the analysis-ready data that we're currently creating by removing the effects of the atmosphere um, in a more precise way to get to the surface reflectance. Um, we could definitely include up cloud masking, for example. Um, so for data that is not yet supplied as analysis ready data form, uh, you will unfortunately have to do this uh, yourself uh, unless it's provided for from the commercial satellite uh, providers themselves. Um, so I was talking about trade-offs earlier. Uh, well, the most common trade-off I will mention again is between spatial resolution and temporal frequency. Um, you have just uh, you will have learnt, learnt about the planet constellation at the end of this day, which is probably one of the only solutions out there to this trade-off. Um, but you have to pay, and unfortunately, very high-resolution data can be pretty expensive at the access point, um, especially if you need large coverage or uh, time series of data. So that's a big cost before you've done any anything with it. Um, and the last limitation, the last but definitely not least, probably one of the most important limitations, is the need for calibration and validation. Now, ideally, we need calib to calibrate sensors with similar measurements on the ground, so field data is essential. Um, validation of products also needs uh, equivalent data sets on the ground, um, So, and the availability of this ground data is a, is a massive limitation at the moment, um, because current systems either don't collect enough data or are not collecting suitable data. Something for us to work on in the future. Uh, so moving on to the advantages. Um, one of the biggest advantages obviously is the um, data is continuously being collected at a variety of different spatial, spectral and temporal scales, um, especially from space. And some of these missions have been around for decades. Um, take Landsat, for example, which started collecting data at 30 meter spatial resolution in the early 80s. So that mission now has five decades worth of data collected about the Earth's surface. Um, so this allows us to not only model and look towards the future, but we can look backwards through time as well. Uh, now, most Earth observation data sets is disseminated as raster data, so can be easily integrated into GIS systems uh, and used with other types of spatial data. Um, and these data also allows us to get complete coverage of the Earth's surface, uh, which more often than not helps us fill gaps for places that are difficult to get to into the field. So Earth observation allows us to monitor remotely as well as measure features such as productivity or vegetation without resorting to destructive measures, which you would have to do to get to the same measurement on the ground. Um, so Earth observation data does give us a, a completely different perspective, uh, allows us to see beyond the visible and it helps us visualize our planet in a, in a very unique way. So to finish, um, I thought I would leave you with the two main questions that I would ask before considering whether Earth observation can help with a specific application, question, issue, uh, or whatever. So understanding the requirement is very, very important. And I get asked all the time, what can Earth observation do for us? Uh, and my response is always, well, what information do you need? Um, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, but hopefully attending today's session will give you some of the knowledge to be able to ask um, more precise questions or even answer some of these questions yourselves with some of the um, evidence and examples that we'll uh, show you in the next couple of sessions. So and that's it for me today. Thanks for listening. Dioch. Thank you, Guara. That was um, fascinating and an awful lot of information to take on board. <laughs> I'm glad we've recorded this so we can go back and look at the detail again. Um, I'm just waiting to see if there's any questions coming through at the moment. We don't have any, so I'll just um, pause for a minute. This is your chance to ask Guara directly anything that's been burning on your mind um, about Earth observation and in particular what you've just seen. So we'll just give it one more minute before we uh, head to a break. suspect there'll be more questions with the applications uh, <laughs> side later, Lynn, to be honest. It's quite dry, the sensor side of, of things, but they're things that we need to know. Um, Absolutely. It's the background. To be able to ask questions, yeah. <laughs>
can always bring you in to answer questions later on the technical yeah. elements. <laughs> Just give it a few more seconds more. There is one question, I think, Lynn. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, Copernicus is a European project. Is there any scope to look at um, EU Earth observation using Sentinel-1 and 2? So yes, Copernicus program is a European Commission project, um, but the Sentinel missions are collect data globally uh, um, and are constantly on and are made available openly and freely to everybody globally. Um, so um, Sentinel-1 and 2, we've been pushing a lot because um, this all happened before Brexit, of course, but Brexit doesn't really impact our access to the data. The data is still going to continue to collect information over the UK as it does the rest of the world. You know, there are a lot of other countries out there that are not members of the European Union that benefit from this as well. Um, so yes, absolutely, we can definitely continue to uh, build uh, applications and integrate Sentinel-1 and 2 into uh, our Earth observing over Europe, or if, if I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting that question correctly, hopefully. Yes, if you've got a, a follow on or want to clarify any of that uh, a bit more clearly, please raise your hand and I'll bring you in if you need, if I can. Okay, as a follow on, uh, would that be accessible via the DEFRA portal? So the EODS, I guess. Yes. So um, while developing the EODS, we um, anticipating that the current access routes to Copernicus data would not be available in the future, depending on how negotiations go uh, towards our membership. Um, we anticipated this and, and our contingency is to get uh, access from one of the DSs, which is an European Space Agency initiative. Um, so we pay to get um, fast access from a different route to the collaborative ground segment, which is the, the normal access route to, for all of the European Commission countries to get fast access to the data. So we kind of assumed that the collaboration ground segment would not be available to us in the future and chose a different access route to the data. And all of that um, is going to be fe fed into EODS uh, as per usual. Um, we're not anticipating any issues to uh, access to the data in the future. I think if I've understood the question correctly, I think they may be asking about whether data for other countries, obviously the Central 1 or 2 yeah. collects globally, would that be available through the no. portal? It's England only and bits of Wales, EODS. But we have processed um, data for other European countries and for the UK of these territories to the same standards for, for special projects, but not, nothing routinely available. Yeah, no. Um, but the European Space Agency do produce a global analysis ready data product for Sentinel-2, not for Sentinel-1. Um, but the problem with global data sets is that, um, you know, we can produce too much better standards at a national level and lots of countries um, produce their own ARD as well. So if you're stuck and don't want to go down the pre-processing route, you can pick up the ESA global surface reflectance project for Sentinel-2. But unfortunately, that doesn't exist for uh, radar at the moment. Thank you, Gwera, and thanks, Paula, for chipping in as well. Um, there's a, a question about LIDAR, which I think I could probably answer, which is, uh, what does it stand for? So this was light uh, detecting and ranging. Um, Guara, Paula, I don't know whether you want to add any more detail to that. Yes, yeah, so I guess light is the LI, uh, A is the AND, and DAR <laughs> is the detection and ranging. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we've stopped using the, the capital letters, small letters, for some reason, um, but uh, showing the acronym uh, like that might have helped with uh, understanding what the acronym stands for. And if you want another look at those slides, obviously they'll be on YouTube yeah. and the PDFs will be uh, available too. So uh, there's another question come in. Um, can the Sentinel-2 satellites collect data on the health of a potato crop of 10 hectares, e.g. virus infection, or will it be better to use a UAS? Ah, well, so this is where spectral resolution plays an important role. So um, 
plant health, um, it's much easier to detect plant health beyond the visible. So near infrared, the short wave infrared would be particularly important. I think here, uh, water content of the leaves would probably give you useful or valuable information about the health of the crop. Um, so you could definitely add those scales, use Sentinel-2 um, to detect the health of your crop at a a field scale, if you like, but if you're wanting to look inside the field, uh, then you would need probably need a little bit more spatial uh, resolution to help you understand if there's a, a corner of the field is worse off than maybe other the parts of the crop. Um, and drones uh, or unmanned aerial systems and unmanned aerial vehicles, um, they're all the same thing, uh, are really commonly used um, for this particular application um, in the field. Um, so there's probably a lot more um, services you can buy in that in that area if you wanted to use drones. Whereas Sentinel, um, you'd probably have to do some of the analysis yourself, um, and you'd get a different perspective. So you'd get more spectral resolution, but less spatial resolution. So drones, yes, Sentinel two can help as well. Great, thanks, Gua. Um... I think that's probably it for questions. We'll just pause for a second, see if there's any more come in, and then it'll be um, a good time for a break. Okay, uh, right, so it's now almost two o'clock, so we'll come back in 10 minutes. So 10 past two, we'll come back for the next section, which is all about the uh, environmental applications with Paula. Okay, see you in a moment.